Are you going to start or what's happening, uh, Randima? Yes, sir. Uh, we are going to start now, sir. Yeah, okay. Okay. Did you know that the transport sector is the fastest growing source of global emissions? About 14% of annual emissions are a result of fossil fuels burning in the transport sector. If sufficient mitigation measures are not taken right away, the carbon dioxide emissions from the transport sector are expected to rise by 60% by 2050. Today, we are going to discuss about one such mitigation measure that we can take. A very good morning to all of you. I am Jayoda Disanayaka from IEEE Student Branch of University of Muratua. And I warmly welcome you all to the webinar on wired and wireless grid integration methods of electric vehicles. COVID-19 pandemic has reminded us the value of breathing clean air freely. We cherish the times that we spent without wearing masks. Imagine having to wear a mask for the rest of your life, not because of a virus, but because of air pollution. Imagine having to breathe toxic, corrosive air every day, everywhere. It's not a pretty picture, is it? But did you know that you yourself contribute to the emissions just by driving a car? Yes, your car releases greenhouse gases which contribute to air pollution, global warming, and climate change. So what is the solution? What is the role of electric vehicles in this? How do electric vehicles contribute to green recovery? Well, you've come to the right place to find your answers. Today, those questions will be answered in detail by an outstanding technical personality. Now, in order to deliver the welcome speech, I cordially invite the treasurer of IEEE Power Electronic Society Student Branch Chapter of University of Muratua, Temal Ekanayaka. Over to you. Hello, everyone. As the treasurer of IEEE Power Electronic Society of University of Muratua, Sri Lanka, it is my pleasure and duty to bid you all a genial welcome for this webinar today. It is a great day, one we have been planned and waiting for. For first and foremost, I would like to welcome a remarkable character for this occasion. He would be the guest speaker for today's webinar, Professor Udaya K. Madhavalar, Professor at Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering of University of Auckland. He is a well-resourced person with a 30-year experience in field of energy and power electronics. We are proud to have you here and waiting to be inspired by your thoughts, Professor. Next on. I would be glad to welcome Professor Udayanga Hemapala, uh, Chapter Advisor of IEEE Power Electronic Society, Student Branch Chapter of University of Maratua. Finally, my dear participants, I am thankful for you, your presence today, and welcome you all with a warm heart to this webinar. Hope you all will have an inspiring time together. You want me to start? Or... <laughs> Before moving on Hello. to the keynote speech, I would like to remind a few things to our audience. The first reminder is to keep your microphones muted during the main session to avoid any disturbances. The second reminder is that there will be a Kahoot session after the keynote speech, which all of you will be able to participate in and win a valuable prize. So listen to the keynote speech very attentively because you stand a chance to win a prize in addition to gaining an abundance of valuable knowledge. The third reminder is that you can type in any question you have in the chat box and we will direct the questions to our speaker if time permits. Without further ado, let me take the pleasure of introducing our esteemed guest speaker. He is a proud product of the Department of Electrical Engineering in University of Moratua. After completing his BSA degree, he went on to complete his PhD in power electronics from the University of Auckland, New Zealand. He has more than 250 IEEE and IET journal and international conference publications and holds a number of patents related to wireless, 
power transfer, vehicle to grid applications, and renewable energy. He is a distinguished lecturer of the IEEE Power Electronics Society and has more than 30 years of both industry and research experience in the fields of power electronics and energy. He has served both the IEEE Power Electronics and Industrial Electronics Societies in numerous roles relating to conferences, technical committees, and chapter activities. He is currently an associate editor for the IEEE Power Electronics and a member of the Sustainable Energy Systems Technical Committee and the Oceania Liaison Chair of Membership Development Committee of the IEEE Power Electronics Society. He currently serves as a professor at the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering in University of Auckland. Please welcome Professor Udaya Kumara Madhavala. Sir, it is an honor to have you here with us today. Over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, can I please uh, share my screen? You had to stop sharing. Thank you. Uh, share. Okay, here we go. Right. Uh, Okay, and um, first of all, Subahuda is on a day, everyone. I, I can still speak English, but unfortunately, I had to give the talk in English. Sorry, I, I can still speak Sinhala. I had to give the talk in um, English. And I still remember when I was studying at University of Morotua, and that was quite uh, some time ago. And uh, I am really actually um, very happy that the student branch uh, at the University of Morotua is um, very active and establishing this power electronics branch, which I really, really wanted to, to happen. So it actually opens up a lot of um, opportunities for young students and to learn about what is happening around the world. Uh, in relation to uh, power electronics. But before I go into that, I would like to thank, first of all, the, the, uh, the committee members who invited me and to give this talk. So what I'm gonna talk about is how I started um, this work. And that was nearly about um, 12 years ago. I started this work about the wireless power for V2G applications. And um, when everyone just sort of laughed at me and how I progress and where we stand now. And before I talked about what I've been doing for the last 10 years or so, and let's go and have a look at what Power Electron Society is. Let's get to the video panel. Okay. We all know that we live in a smart world. Everything is smart. I'm pretty sure every one of you got a smartphone. You got a smartphone, smart appliances, smart vehicles, and electric vehicles, and the smart homes, smart medical care, smart buildings, and that forms the smart world. But what is essential required is the energy. And so we had to have this energy. Just because we have the energy doesn't mean that we can use it. And that's the society. And we are the society that have electronics. So I don't know how many of you guys are members of the Power Electron Society, and I would encourage you to become a member. There are heaps of opportunities to advance your career. Just to give an idea, I'll give a little bit background of the Power Electron Society, who are the key personnel. Then I talked about the benefit that you can have by joining. The power electron society. So these are the officers, and the Freddy Blavia, I see the president at the moment, and the president elect from next year onwards is going to be Li Ching Chang, and these are the past presidents. And also remember that, and I'm a distinguished lecturer for the society, but it doesn't mean that, and I'm the only person there, and there are a few others at, who are very, very good in their field. So I would encourage you to. Uh, get in touch with them and have some seminars that from which and that you can actually advance your career, you can learn what's happening in that particular arena. So the benefits, the first thing 
uh, perhaps I'll come into that uh, a little bit later there, the publications. And these are the different types of publication that we have, the Power Electron Society and the Power Electrons Letters and the transactions, the power electronics, emerging and selected topics, and the, the magazines there. So you're at this stage, since you're an undergraduate and you are just learning into the space that you learn a little bit about research, where you go when you pass, and the final year, then you go and step into the your professional career, then you get a little bit more about what are the advances taking place in this arena. So if you want to keep up with, if you want to advance your career, whether as an engineer or an academic or a researcher, and this part of that, and this is the place where I should go because that is where we publish all the latest developments within power electronics. So if you want to, you, this is an ideal opportunity for you to even now, I actually do not know University of Morotua does have the, uh, what you call the free membership or free access to IEEE journals. So this is where I should go. Whatever your interests are, sometimes you know, the interests are different and you have to perceive or rather follow your passion, what you want to do. Some might want to do some power electronics and there are different different aspects of power electrons, motor drives. For example, I'm now doing uh, wireless power trans, which I used to do motor drives and the generators, renewable energy, and heaps of things that you can learn and do and advance your career. So this is the opportunity where you can go and learn about that, go and read and expand your knowledge. Because sometimes we just limit, I know that when I was studying at the University of Moto too, we don't look outside the box. And you have to be, you know, if you want to really, really advance and you had to make a difference there, you had to think, you know, outside the box. So you must be a lateral thinker. Just because someone says, this is the way it is, don't believe that. Okay, if you want to pursue something, if you want to achieve something, you know, you can do it. So that's a very important thing and you should learn that just don't and to literally take what's being told. You can question. I know that in Sri Lanka, you don't question, right? And here in these countries, we have all our students questions and that's the way that you can learn. And if you have any doubts, and that's the way that you can you know, ask some questions and understand and what's behind, what's the philosophy, what's the theory behind that? How do we apply? It is not just believing in what the book says there and go by the fundamental that you can go a long way. And that's what I have done. It was a very difficult journey for me. And, but I learned that way and then to broaden my knowledge. Okay, so these are the places you should want to, you can go and read about that. And I'm also, I would very, be very happy to help anyone who needs some help. Okay, and just write to me. I'm very happy to extend my help. So the membership. And the first thing that the student asks, hey, I'm paying, I can't remember how much it costs, I think about $15 or so, to get the membership for students, it's discounted, and what I'm going to get. Uh, that's a valid question, but there are many things that you can get out of the $15. So there are conferences where you can go online access to all the proceedings there. There's a resource center, easy access and the technical committees and that you can join. And this chapter itself is a very good opportunity for you to um, develop some leadership skills and network. And there are heaps of opportunities. And if you join the IEEE, that's the largest organization, professional organization um, for electrical engineers in the world. And then the networking, as I mentioned that, and we have some key conferences and for the, the young professional, you can join and you can network. I know that this is not the ideal uh, situation worldwide because of the COVID and otherwise, this is the place that people go and network and establish relationship, share ideas and, you know, and that's how you advance the career. So these are the conferences I know that uh, may be very difficult for in the, students in Sri Lanka to participate, but nevertheless, there are some uh, this, uh, opportunities and also the student travel grants that you can, if you are a PhD student or a master's and you can participate because we will support that because you are the one going to be the future and the professionals there. So we like to mentor, we like to help you to, to 
uh, advance your career. So as you can see that there are a number of uh, conferences, as you can see the, the bottom one, the spec, and that is I'm the found, one of the founding members of that conference that's called the um, Southern Power Electronics Conference. And the reason for that conference was established and uh, we want to bring this expertise so the advances to Southern Hemisphere. You might ask why? Because there are so many, if you look at Latin America, if you look at Africa, if you look at uh, some of the Asian countries there, we don't have the same resources, not even uh, just leave alone the conferences and to have access to some of these special resources, we don't have it. So we want to promote what's happening and raise awareness among all the members or even other people about power electronics and how important it is. And that's with that objective, we form this Southern Power Electronics Conference and it's a very successful conference, unfortunately. We couldn't hold it this year because of COVID. And what I'm trying to explain is that these conferences are there for uh, professionals to go and network and establish relationship and also share ideas. And of course we have this women in engineering or the female students, we encourage that and to participate. There are huge opportunities and the mentorship events too. And become a student, as you can see that we have a future energy challenge that as a university, if you want to, you can put an application there. Hey, you know, I think every two years we have it and that you can participate. It doesn't matter. We will give you some support for that. And as I mentioned before, you have student travel grants and the mentorship programs. And if you want to, and you can, uh, I know that it's difficult to travel, but you can go um, join online. And there we give a career for uh, advice or career development, maybe a professional engineer, maybe a researcher, maybe an academic. And how do you conduct research? How you progress in your career and what things that you can do? Because these are free, just become a student membership is a discounted fee. So, and also we have the best uh, PhD thesis talk. And I'm not quite sure whether the University of Monaco is offering any uh, PhD scholarship, at, uh, sorry, uh, uh, degrees at this stage. But for those who are doing PhD in um, conjunction with other universities, you may be able to apply and it's a very, very good opportunity for you. So if you haven't, I know that all of you guys have joined the Power Electron Society, I believe so. And please do encourage others to join the Power Electron um, Society and also the IEEE. So um, just to talk about um, what I've been doing, electric vehicles, wireless and wired charging. So before we go into that, and let's have a look at electric vehicles. As you know, I'm, I can't remember uh, that the person who introduced me and they talked about that, and that's going to be the future. It is not only electric vehicles and electric trains there, electric uh, aircrafts there, electric freights there, and electric trucks is going to come into to play too. So if you take electric vehicles and EVs, and that can be regarded as the means of future transport, that's going to be the case. As mentioned before, they reduce pollution, enable efficient and clean transport, and ideal for sustainable living. Not only that, and it can be used in alternative energy storage to offer grid services. And what are these grid services and other services? And I will come back to that a little bit later. Let's have a look at, oh, I don't know why it's coming there. Um, global EV sales by country. Now I got on the left-hand side, the column in 2015. I haven't got the updated one for the 2019 and the website hasn't been updated. But nevertheless, you can see that from 2015 to when you go to 2018, 207,000 in China electric vehicle and the uptake is 1.25 million. It's almost how many times sixfold. It's gone up within the span of only four years. So if you take the global market, it's no different from half a million, 564,000 to about 2.2 million. So this is by country. Now, if you take each model, the EV type, and there you can see from 2017, of course, China again is dominating the BYD and the bike there and 114,000 to about 215 within one year. And 96,000 to 160,000. And if you take Tesla, 
and this is still not updated, 93,000 to within two years and 360,000 vehicles. So what does that mean? And the uptake of electric vehicles is going to continue and this trend is going to continue. But when this is continuing, there are some challenges. It doesn't come without any challenges. The first challenge is the charging rate as the power level. And of course, that depends on the charging system and the type of the electric vehicle and the grid, whether it is weak or strong, can we support and the standards, etc., which I will discuss um, in a minute. And now the latest charges, actually, they can offer charging less than 30 minutes. That means fast charging, it's very fast. Now, what will happen to the battery is a different thing, but you can charge very, very fast, very quickly. And then the distance per charge. And um, so that is called the range anxiety. And at the beginning, people are so worried. If I charge, okay, with one charge, once I fully charge my car, how far can I travel? So this is a problem at the beginning. Now, so that of course it be bad um, based on the type of the electric vehicle and the battery capacity. And now all these new vehicles, actually the electric vehicles like Chevrolet Bolt and Kia and the Hyundai and also the Tesla, they get 250 to 370 miles on a single charge. And of course, that and then we have more and more stations it's called the charging stations for easy access. So it doesn't matter. This is more and more stations are available. You can charge quickly too. So you don't have to worry about that. You're going to it's like running out of petrol in nowhere that you had to wait someone to bring petrol. And there are more and more charging stations there. And then the battery. That's another concern, the size, weight, cost, and the life and the disposal. How do we dispose? More and more batteries coming, you know environmental um, adverse effects. So I wouldn't go too much into those details, but these are some of the challenges and the concerns. And if you take the size of the battery, yes, you know that the lithium ion batteries have been used because they have high energy density, but they are still significantly heavy still and bulky and expensive. And for example, put, it, put everything in context and the Nissan Leaf, you get it 24 kilowatt hour, 200 kilograms. And if you go to Tesla, it is almost for a 85 kilowatt hour battery, it is half a ton, 540 kilograms. And the cost is approximately 130 to 145 kilowatts per hour. And it is uh, 2000, 2016 now. GM is working on reducing it to about $100. And by 2021, I don't know if that's going to happen or not, but the trend is the cost is coming down. And the lifespan is a concern too. It is very limited and three to eight years, that's a hundred kilometers. But it doesn't mean that that's going to be the case. This is what I was talking to you before that technology is evolving. It's always advanced something is happening. It's like your smartphones, right? You can't keep up with that. And every year they put another one with different features, perhaps a different performance, very improved. Likewise for the batteries as well, the technologies, even the power electronics, the electric vehicle, everything is changing. That's what the research is about. And for an example, a, a Chinese car battery manufacturer says that oh, they're ready to and to give away a new uh, battery. And that is capable of powering 1.2 million miles across the course of a 16 year lifespan. So that's what I think they have signed a pact with uh, Tesla and it's on news. And not only that, in the university in the UK, they are developing a beta voltage battery, it's what they call, I don't know. And that's called the man being diamonds. And to offer constant current lasting for thousands of years. So that's what the future is going to be. So there won't be any problem with the batteries as such. So the battery, the cost is going to come down too. And then the other biggest challenge is the impact on the EV, oh, sorry, impact of electric vehicles on the grid. And just imagine that everyone is having an electric vehicle and they were going to work and coming home and charging multiple, multiple vehicles getting charged at night. So what would be the, the impact on the grid? And how can we cope up with that? That's leading to increased power demand. In the UK alone, 700,000 electric vehicles expected in 20 this year and needing 500 megawatts of power. So where does it come from? 
So more and more countries are now moving to fully electric by banning petrol and diesel vehicle. For example, and then the UK, and they wanted to go for uh, ban all the diesel and the petrol cars in 2024. 20, 20, and that was in 2017, that was what they wanted to do. And the last week I heard that from the BBC that now they are going to the government. They want to bring it forward by a decade. So 2030, they want to ban decent petrol cars. And the China and the first to decide that, and that was a few years ago, and they wanted to go fully electric by 2040. Just imagine millions and millions of cars. And what would the impact on the grid? I did some work on that and how to mitigate these issues. But my talk is not about that. But nevertheless, what it means is that this the serious concern, but this is somewhat can be mitigated or addressed through optimized or smart charging strategies. And that is your energy shifting, and you know, you can somehow or other you can have a smart way of charging that you can within the whatever the power available, you can accommodate to a certain extent and charging electric vehicles. But what is unavoidable is that upgrades of power networks, substations, and infrastructure. That is inevitable. Okay, so do we have to do that because we can't keep up with this demand. So these are the challenges. So now if you go into the means of charging, then if you set aside that one there, okay, whether we are going to go for wired or wireless. And if you go to wired, relatively simple. And as you can see, you can connect the cable and just plug it in, it charges and less infrastructure change. And the standards already been established and it is in use at present. But if you go to wireless, it's robust, safe, convenient because it's through magnetic coupling, the wireless charging takes place, can be used anywhere, ice, water, doesn't matter. But in comparison to wired, huge infrastructure change. And the standard just been released as the SAEJ2954, and in my opinion, can be deployed everywhere. Just imagine for the third world countries, in very remote places to have this infrastructure. It's not be that difficult, it's not be easy. Uh, it's very, I think it is more um, suitable for urban uh, applications. And this is at the development stage. And here are the standards, perhaps you may be aware of that. And they are going from the onboard because the charge is small, right? AC level one, AC level two, and this is the say you the American standard there you can the amount of power level is not very high so that means it takes a long time for a given capacity to be charged but when you go to DC charging DC level one to level two so off board charge off board charging means you cannot mount the charger on the car the reason is is too heavy so it's a commercial entity there so it's off board you just you know go go to the charging place and you can charge and whereas for the AC level one and two and you can do that at home and those are the DC level ones are called the fast charge. You can charge so quickly. And the equivalent from the, the European standard is IEC. And you can see the mode one, mode two, mode three, the, the three phase one. And then of course the mode four is a DC rapid charger. And that's for the fast charger. And I'll show you some of those ones. And here's the level one, here's the level two. And there you can see that the, this you can connect it through the cable level one. And the level two, you can see the size of the charger a little bit bigger. So you need to have, you can't mount it on the car. Okay, and there, this, these are the fast charge, the Chedemo, and there you can see how big it is. So, but they provide much more power than the level one. So you can charge the battery within a very short period of time. And here is the Tesla. So now to wireless EV charging. So what is wireless EV charging? So this depends on actually based on inductive power transfer technology that was developed at the University of Oakland and early 90s or late 80s so uh, it has taken uh, you know since then it has matured quite a, um, a lot and it's been applied to ev charging as well so what is inductive power transfer technology and here it's a coil there and you can see on your right hand side we have a grid you know the grid we have 50 hertz then from the grid and then we synthesize so we create a high frequency signal or high frequency voltage and then you can see that the blue part here, and it's a coil called the station or the ground pad or a coil or a coupler there. So when we have this high frequency current there, as obviously, as you know, it creates a magnetic high frequency magnetic field and the car comes and parks. And underneath the car, there's another coil. 
just a coil there, and that magnetic field is intercepted, and through the magnetic coupling, power transfer takes place across the air cup. So that is called the inductive power transfer technology. And there you can see, and that's the magnetic field creator. It's coupled to the, um, uh, the, the coil or the coupler underneath the car, and through the magnetic coupling, power transfer takes place. And you can see from the arrow, the, the power transfer going, or the energy flow is from the grid side of the electric vehicle. So when this happened, so about, about 10 or 11 years ago, I was thinking, oh no, I want to do wireless power transfer in both directions. So I want to control the power in both places. And that's how I started this work. So I'm going to talk about that since then, what I have done, okay? So in a wireless charging too, there are some challenges. First to the electronic charging system, so fully electronic. And then the magnetic couplers, which I was just talking about. Pair, sometimes people call it pads, coil, it's, it's a coil, okay? Sometimes some people call it and the receiver or transmitter. Nevertheless, we call it magnetic coupler. So let's have a look at the electronic charging system. And that can be stationary. That means the car comes and park, the car doesn't move. Or it can be stationary or dynamic. That means dynamic means car is traveling at a speed of 100 kilometers per hour. Pulses of energy being developed over the power, okay? And that's been absorbed or transferred to the car wireless. It's called a dynamic charge and this has been done and then tested too. And that's what the future is going to be. There will be dedicated lanes, okay? And the cars will be traveling at 100 kilometers per hour, pulses of energy coming, and then you charge the car. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to stop the car. But anyway, okay? Uh, both of these cases, you have to somehow over the control the amount of power transfer. So it's up to about 25 kilowatts. And the energy flow, whether it is unidirectional, one way, or bidirectional, both ways. And how do we achieve it? And this normally takes place at high frequency, which is not at 50 hertz. And the conversion. And can we had to have electronic topologies there. And the power converters, a variety of topologies have been proposed and implemented very successfully and tested as well. And then essentially employ high order resonance circuit. And I will explain that a little bit later on. And here it assess me in the series, 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 parallel, parallel, parallel. Different types of resonance circuits there because they have different characteristics. And then we had to regulate the power. So we had to control the power. And so in order to do that, we can have active, passive, primary, and secondary side control too. Then we go to magnetic couplers there. So the magnetic coupler, you have to design the magnetics and you have because you have to contain the magnetic field within you know, the certain space. And also you had to minimize the cost. You had to minimize the size. And we want to make sure that for the minimum amount of, for an example, for right, and you can have the maximum coupling. What is mean by the coupling? The mutual inductor. So the two coils are coupled. So a lot of work's been going into um, this research area and to optimize this, uh, you know, to get the best performance with the minimum size and the minimum amount of material, minimum cost. And what actually happens if the pads are not misaligned? And what happens if the flux or negative flux leaks out? It's not very good. You can't uh, operate other equipment. So a lot of work um, uh, has gone into that one and people have proposed different types of uh, coils and they range from circular DD, DDQ, solenoids and bipole, et cetera. And then the standards, and this has been released, I think uh, a few months ago, and this is called J2954 and the American standard and the LDV, uh, EV stand for light duty electric vehicle. The heavy duty one is the slash two. It's going to be released later on. So this standard looks into safety, performance, interoperable, the communication, because you can't simply charge. Now, how do we control? F4D means a foreign object detection. Something happens in between. How do we detect it and stop charging? Living object detection, LODs, radiated conductive emission, etc. And the frequency, as I said, high frequency, set to the power transfer takes place across an aircraft at 85 kilohertz. And what we have the range from 79 to 90 kilohertz there. And the target efficiency when the coils are aligned by 85% and when they're misaligned, it's about, because the offset's about 80%. And these are the standards. The power classes, there are four power classes, WPT one to four, that ranges from 3.7 to about 22. 
KBA. So that's how the first batch of electric vehicles is going to be charged. Okay, these are the standards. Now, V2X concept. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the bidirectional, okay, and the, the technology. So normally we saw V2G. Actually, now it is called V2X. X can be anything. Okay, so where does it come from? So the question is, are electric vehicles used only for commuting? That is only for traveling. Actually, this is not the case, isn't it? We all know about the V2G GTV concept. So what it means is, as I mentioned at the beginning, the battery of the vehicle can be used to as a storing element. So the off-peak time you can charge, you can store energy, and the peak time you can put it onto the grid, or you can use it by yourself, and you don't have to pay more to use electricity. That's called the V2G GTV concept. The other one is called the building or home to vehicle, or vehicle to building a home. It's a concept that you can power. And another one is the vehicle to vehicle concept there. And you must be thinking, and this is something I was uh, trying to do a long time ago and people didn't believe, and I'll show you some of the slides later on. And uh, how do you exchange? So this is an example there. Here's we have a charging bay. There's a number of cars, it's, it's limited capacity. As you can see, the cars are coming. And as you can see, the the power or the energy demand. And that shows the thickness of that arrow. And the last person who came in such a hurry wants to get charged, you know, more energy to charge quickly, but it is out of the capability of the system there. So what can do the other cars? And for an example, you can see the bottom left-hand corner and the arrows being changed and they can put the energy back. Hey, I'm not in a hurry, okay? I'm gonna put the energy back into the system there. And I can get a rebate or I can, you know, make some money out of that. I will charge at a cheaper rate. So later on, so, and similarly, another car comes and we cannot meet the demand. Someone has to give energy back there, there it is. So what does that mean? So all these concepts, whether it is V2G, whether it is from building or homes of the vehicle or vehicle to vehicle, what does that mean? What is common is this. We had to have on the right-hand side, we have the electric vehicle and the left-hand side, we had the grid or whatever the X system there you had to have a bi-directional energy flow. So you had to have a bi-directional charge or electronic converter. So we are gonna do that in a wireless manner, okay? Without no contact whatsoever, the power goes both ways in control manner across an air grid. So how do we do that? So this is how I started a while ago, okay? And that's the bi-directional wireless power transfer systems. For V to X application, here's a typical system. I don't know the, the extent that um, how much you know about the con contents, and I'll try to keep it at the concept level, okay? But I'm pretty sure you know about the rectifiers and the converters there. On the left hand side, and you can see the grid there, and this is called the ground assembly. This is in turn um, with respect to in relation to electric vehicle charging, okay? But it doesn't mean that these systems can be applied to other applications. Okay, here's the ground assembly there. So what does it have? And left-hand side is the grid, 50 to 60 hertz and the AC, okay? And that we convert that into DC. And as I explained to you or mentioned to you before, the power transfer takes by 85 kilohertz. So we had to convert that 50 hertz to DC and the gain through DC, AC. There it is, 85 kilohertz. Because the power transfer takes place at 85 kilohertz. Then we have a compensation. You must be wondering what is this? Okay, and then we have this charging coil. These are the coils, okay? Remember I told you the stationary coil in the pad, the couplers, so whatever you call it, right? And then we had a mutual coupling between those two and then the air cap across which the, the power or the energy transfer takes place. Now, then we have this vehicle assembly, same thing the vehicle has. So the coil there, remember, underneath the vehicle, the coil there mounted. Then we have a compensation circuit there. When we have, a, again a converter because this is the 85 kilohertz we had to convert that into dc we have a converter okay now if i take that part there and if i take it out so only the dc to dc part there okay so the dc is going to high frequency high frequency converted to again to dc there you have it. so you can see the the circle it's called the compensation what is meant by compensation now from you I think you know the transformer theory. When you have a transformer there, the coupling is very high. What does that mean? The coupling factor, 
and the primary side and the secondary side is very high. Ideally speaking, it is one. There is no leakage. But whereas, because why the transformers do not have an air gap? But when we have an air gap, what does that mean? The coupling is very small. So it could be 0.2 to 0.3. So meaning that the leakage is very high. So what it means, if you want to transfer any real amount of power, you need to give a lot of VAS, reactive power. So what does that mean then? Your inverters or the converters have to be rated to a higher VA rating to even to transfer small amount of active power because you need more reactive power. You have the power factor, very bad. So the one way to get around this is that we can compensate for the wire requirement. What we can do, we connect a capacitor, okay? So just because connecting a capacitor doesn't work, right? So it can to a certain extent, okay? There's a frequency there. So, and these networks called the compensation network there, it can be series, series, parallel, parallel, or series, parallel, parallel, series, whatever the combination. So the parallel means the capacity is connected in parallel with the, the coil, or series in series. So what actually it does is we excite the converters at 85 kilohertz, they all resonate. And there's no, because the energy transfer takes place with the inductor and the capacitor, nothing being drawn from the converters. So the minimum wire requirement, it's like a, an unity power factor there. It's only the converter sees the resistive loads there. So all IPT circuits will be charging and there, that is why there are resonant circuits there. So the resonant takes place, resonance takes place at 85 kilohertz. Otherwise we cannot have an efficient power regulation there. Otherwise we had to put lots of was. Okay, so now in this particular case, this is called the parallel tune resonance circuit, both sides. So they resonate at 85 kilohertz. And because these components, all the capacitors are selected in such a manner that when I turn, when I drive these converters or excite these converters, whatever the voltage waveforms, at that particular frequency it resonates at 85 kilohertz. Okay, so now if I simplify this one at the 85 kilohertz, I get this one. And here's a power transfer. You can see that the power is going back and forth. So what we can do, it's an eighth of resonance circuit there. We can't do PWM. Why 85 kilohertz? We can't do PWM there. Because the power transfer, the frequency, the fundamental frequency is 85 kilohertz. So what? we do phase shift modulation, okay? And you can control the phase shifts there. So you can control the voltage that is generated by the two converters there. And also the two converters, they need to be synchronized to transfer power there. So what we normally do is like this. Now we got three variables, phi P, phi S in this equation, that actually the ones that's controlling the phase modulation that control the voltages produced by the two converters, V, P, I, V, A. And the angle between those is the theta. So as you can see, if the theta is not 90, you have reactive power. So it's like impedance matching. You can control the secondary side impedance there, okay? But we don't, um, we, we always keep the theta at plus or minus 90. And there you can see on the bottom diagram, so we keep the plus or minus 90 to, to dictate to the direction of the power flow, plus or plus 90 or nine, depending on that one, power goes from left hand to the right hand side, or in other words, a grid to the electric vehicle or electric vehicle. And then we change the magnitude of the voltages to control the magnitude or the amount of power flow in whatever the direction that you choose, okay? And there you can see the reverse and forward direction. And I show you this is what we built long time ago, okay? And that you can see the gap there. And this is the gap. That was about 400 uh, millimeters at that time, I can remember. And here's the video for a long time ago. And you can see the power is going both ways and across this air gap there, okay? Now that was long time ago. Since then we have come a long way, okay? And here's a G to V and V to G concept. Now, remember I told you, if the voltage, one voltage is lagging and the power transfers from the leading side to the lagging side there. Now here you can see the electric vehicle on the bottom plot there, and you can see the red arrow and the voltage is in blue that is lagging the voltage produced by the grid side converter. So the grid is giving energy to the electric vehicle, okay? Same thing, now the electric vehicle is giving energy back into the, the grid. There you can see that the electric vehicle side, the voltage waveform is leading the grid side voltage there. 
And here's another one, multiple electric vehicles. What is actually happening? There's another one with the both electric vehicles either idling or giving power back to the grid. Okay. So as I said that, um, since then we have done a lot of work, but I can't talk about everything. I'm going to give you a um, few of the project, a few of the, the techniques that we have developed in relation to pad misalignment and the control. So the, uh, one of the biggest problem is the pad misalignment. Car comes and parks. How do you ensure that do you think that even with the, you know, the all this automatic parking and everything, you may be able to do that, okay? But it's going to be an issue that if it is not perfectly aligned, these two coil, there are some consequences because always these are subjected to lateral and longitudinal misalignment. What does it mean? This is like this. See that? So when that happens, the mutual coupling, the coupling between the two coils vary. So when the coupling of between the two coils vary, and sometimes inductances as well, it is going to be due to. And more than that, with the coupling changes, they are the reflected load, like a transformer. Okay? Reflected load, that's going to be changed. If it is going to be changed if it's due to, you know, you had to give more was to the system there, you won't be able to regulate the power. So what can you do? Can you again put another e Capacity, you can't do that. Right? This whole system is designed. So how can we mitigate this problem? So there are two ways to do that. It's called the passive control, okay? So the passive control is that each compensation network or the technique and that, that gives different characteristics. So the top one is called, you can see the parallel tune. That's mean the capacitors are connected in parallel, the CPT, okay? And the, the bottom one, you can see the series too. The capacity is connected in series. So they have different characteristics. So when you have different characteristics, and this is called the hybrid, it makes the use of the complementary characteristics, okay? For an example, if the mutual inductance is increasing, one compensation, the power transfer decreases, whereas the other one, the power transfer increases. So if you combine them together and they are complementary, Okay, in other words, the nature of the reflected load is complementary. Okay, so what it means is like this. We have a look, I have a video, right, to show that how we have um, uh, implemented this system, our, our, our group. But since the given the time frame, I have removed the video to save some time. There you can see that on the right hand side, M11 and M22, that means the coupling there. In the one system, or one compensation strategy, the power transfer is directly proportional to M. That's the coupling. And whereas the other one, it is inversely proportional. So therefore, if you combine them together, and we can actually more or less uniformly regulate the power transfer. So this is what is happening. There you can see that the one curve that goes down, the distance between the pad, that's the change in the coupling there. So the distance between the pads or the coils increases and the one system that you can see the power is coming down, whereas the other one power is increasing. Well, what happens if you combine them together? You can get constant power. So this is called the, the passive way of mitigating the issues, okay? And the relation related to the pad misalignment, the coil misalignment. The other one to do that, is, this is some of my recent work here, optimal conditions, can we do Control, we have two converters. Can we do that? This is what happened. We had control, four control variables. One of the control variables, and here's the voltage, second side voltage, the beta is the phase due to cycle, you can see it, you know? And you can control the voltages, or you can control the frequency, or you can control the phase angle between these two, or control the impedance, okay? So by controlling the second side converter there. But the question is, how do we find out the best combination? Because there are endless combinations of four variables. Which one is the best? So how do you find out the optimum value that will regulate the power, you know, whatever the power that you want? And this and also the maximum efficiency despite any paired misalignment. Doesn't matter. We don't want to know anything about that. Automatically we control. It's called the impedance matching. Okay, and there you can see the XL, ZLQ, and that in the secondary side, I can control the inverter as an active load. Okay, 
So how do we do that? And we came up with a strategy that is a two-stage optimization process. First stage, we optimize the, the four control variables. Okay, and that is true. And stage one, sorry, optimize the AC to AC converse stage with impedance measure. Remember, we have DC to DC and AC to AC. AC to AC is the wireless power transfer. So I'm going to first optimize that one there yeah, to get the maximum efficiency. And this is what we do. So I control that. I can find out the, what is the optimum value of the load resistance that is required for any given amount of power. And that also, that will give me the maximum efficiency. From that, I can find out what should be mother secondary side due to cycle, what should operate there, okay? And that's the due to cycle. What is the voltage that I should produce, in other words? So once I know that, then I can find out what I could do to have the serial voltage switching operation. Serial voltage switching operation is, um, how do I put it across? Perhaps you must, I don't know, you must have learned. When the switches are turned on and off, there are switching losses. But if you turn the switches on or off, either the voltage or the current, when you zero, we can minimize the switching losses. So that is why it's called the zero voltage switching. So once I know the voltage, then I can find out from that voltage, knowing that one there, what should be the angle that I should create on the secondary side that I can minimize my switching loss, called the zero voltage switching. Okay, so once I know that one there, then I get the reactance that is required by controlling the frequency. That means no VAR requirement whatsoever. It's like a resistive load. So once I know that one there, then I can find out the what should be the voltage that I should use on the primary side in order to have my whatever the amount of power with the zero voltage switching on the primary side converted to. So this is what it is. And we implemented that. And there you can see that how we did it. We didn't measure anything. Mutual inductance is changing. We don't worry about that. We measure the input impedance. From that, we estimate the mutual inductance in the output power. And we implemented this system. And there you can see. Now you can see that there are three plots. DPS stands for if I control two variables. TPS stands for if I control three variables. And the other one is our method with the four variables there. You can see that all those methods there and our methods, the minimum current and the the, the, the x-axis is the mutual inductance, the coupling, you know, the varying, the coils varying there. So you can see the minimum current. What does that mean? The best efficiency, same amount of power. Okay, I think this is for one, one kilowatt. And here the system efficiency. There you can see the mutual inductance varies from 60 to 21 micro and uh, Henry's. Our method, the optimal control, gives the highest efficiency, all the techniques that is available at the moment. Okay, right. So that's about a little bit of the control. Now I talked about the wireless power transfer control. I don't know how much time I got now. Oh, so um, I, I believe it is okay, right? I, I'll just carry on. Randima, um, shall I carry on or shall I? It's already, I think okay. I took a little bit longer time. Is it okay with the guys? Yes, sir, it's okay. Take your time. Right. Okay, right. So what I um, told before was the wireless power trans system. Okay, that is DC to DC. It's so the DC converted to high frequency 85 kilohertz, 85 kilohertz again converted to DC. That is the wireless, okay, both ways. Now, anyway, we had connect the electric vehicle to the grid. And there you can see the grid side, 50 hertz. We had to convert that into 85 kilohertz. How do we do that? Two stages, right? AC to DC, DC to AC. Okay, so we are thinking that. And or can we convert AC to AC from 50 to 85 kilo straight away? That is with the matrix convert. Okay. So, and also to do that with the bidirectional power flow as a resonant convert at 85 kilohertz and wirelessly. Because the matrix converters are not new, but they've been done for a long time, but they're not very low frequency, not for wireless power either. Okay. Not for bidirectional either. So, what are the advantages? Reduce number of conversion stages. And you don't have to do the low frequency to, to DC, DC to high frequency. It does not require a large filter inductor. We straightly convert from 50 to 85 kilohertz, but pretty complex. Okay, so what's the complexity? But leaving it aside, and let's have a look at what's happening here. 
we have a grid, right? That's the voltage. So the, that grid voltage, the 50 hertz or 60 hertz, depending on the country where you live. In Sri Lanka, it is 50 hertz. In New Zealand, it's 50 hertz there. Okay. Now I'm going to derive from this one 85 kilohertz from this matrix converter. These are bidirectional switches. Okay. And they control the power flow, resonance circuit both ways. So what I can do is because the grid voltage is fixed, what I can do is only to control the grid current. So if you work out of what is the grid current is, this is what you have, the grid current. It's very, this is dominant component, okay? So what can I do? We want to regulate power. So if you want to regulate power, you have to control the grid current. To control the grid current, I have to control the phi one, the volt phi one and phi two, and that is the voltages produced by the two converters and the angle between the two voltages. And how do we do that? Okay, so normally we keep that theta, the angle between the two voltages produced by the converter, 90 degrees, or plus or minus 90, depending on the plus or minus, the power goes from grid to the electric vehicle or electric vehicle side to the grid. Now we have two other variables to fix the current, phi one and phi two for any given amount of power. So we can fix the current for a given amount of power, then the voltage, the unity power factor, that will give us the, the power. But we have a problem. The problem is this. There you can see I have fixed phi one, let's say given direction of theta, that is plus or minus 90 for any given power output. So if I fix those value there, and here's my fixed value, the phi two, that's the duty cycle or the voltage produced by the secondary side converter there. Now, if you look at my grid current, it's going to be a square wave there. Problem, why? Lots of harmonics there. It's not good. So what can we do? So we came up with a way, way to mitigate this problem. So what we do is we fix the primary side voltage to give the whatever the current that you need. And then the theta, we define a plus or minus 90 the direction of the power flow. Then we change the secondary side due to cycle with time linearly like this. So if we do like that, this is what you end up, end up with. And there you can see that by changing the duty cycle linearly over the cycle on the secondary side, we can synthesize a really good, ideally speaking, really pure sinusoidal grid current. So that we can mitigate the issues associated with the THD. And there you can see the experimental results and simulation results. Simulations are on the left-hand side and the experimental results are on the right-hand side there. And why the green one is the current that you can see that the voltage and the current are in phase. What does that mean? The grid side is giving power to the electric vehicle. And there you can see they're out of phase, the green one with the blue one. So the voltage and the current. So what it means the grid is receiving power from the electric vehicle. Okay. And there you can see the theta is minus pi by two and the bottom one theta is pi by two. That means the direction of the power flow has been changed. Okay, so that's about uh, the matrix converter. Now, this is something that we recently did, and that is to the, it's called the versatile wireless power interface, vehicle to grid home, okay? So remember I told you that the vehicle can be used to power your houses as well, household needs or emergency, okay? So let's have a look at it. And here we have vehicle to grid heaps of units there at the moment, okay? So if I take one of these units, I'll have a look at it. That's the wireless interface I was talking about, okay? And the wireless power transfer, I, I explain how it works and I can control the power flow between the electric vehicle and the grid. Now we have a house here. The household has nonlinear loads and the PL, PL, QL is reactive power and also the harmonic power. So we have to give or address the harmonic power reactive power we had to give the interface can give that there okay and then the active power is only supplied by the grid either the plus or minus pv means either the electric vehicle is charging or discharging okay now this can be operated in five different modes i would go too much into detail and here you know just to give a very simple way grid is giving active power to the household and the this is, there's no electric vehicle, but the power interface still has to be there, right? The stationary power interface, because it's a wireless. The car is gone, okay? So that part is gone, but that the, still the interface is there. We can use that, 
okay, to give reactive power, okay, requirement of the house. And this is the electric or the grid is charge in the electric vehicle as well as giving active power to the household. Whereas the, the vehicle is taking care of the reactive power requirement of the house. And this the vehicle is now giving, if you have more power, you are putting it to the grid. If the household doesn't need that much of power, you put that excess power into the grid there, the other way around. And here's another one, both the vehicle and the grid, because household needs more power, the grid is you know, not capable of giving, sorry, the electric vehicle giving all that power. So therefore some active power is drawn from the electric, uh, so the grid side there. And here is the islanded mode. There's no grid whatsoever. And uh, the vehicle is actually supplying power to the house. So I'll show you some of the, uh, um, oh, before I go into that, I'll talk about the control philosophy, a little bit about that. And here's our normal one, controls the charging or discharging. And here's our load here. And this is a typical for the grid type converter or the converter there. It gives, it facilitates the energy transfer between the electric vehicle and the grid. And not only that, we now configure this as the uh, power quality, okay? And before we have that, if it is just a normal uh, grid type converter, the grid has to take care of the active power as well as the load reactive power. But if we configure this grid type converter now as a power quality con control converter, and we can make sure that the, the interface is actually taking care of the the all the harmonic power and the reactive power requirement of the household. Whereas the grid only takes care of the active power. So it's very good, right? It's like a power factor correction there. There's no reactive power requirement there. Not only that, normally we know that when you have AC to DC, DC to AC, whatever the conversion, you have a DC link, right? Because you have low frequency converter and the high frequency converter there. We keep the DC link constant, but we, decided to have an adaptive way we control the the voltage of this dc link depending on the power requirement so that i can actually maximize the power transfer on the wireless power transfer side in other words i can enable zero voltage switching operation to minimize losses and that's what we did and to just show you some results there you can see the load there and here the load is 430 volts this is an experimental system and the pv that is the uh, power given by the that's the electric vehicle and the grid is supplying power to the household negative sign comes the electric vehicle is giving power back and that's going to the household there 250 volts and there you can see the load reactive power is 200 right was whereas it's, it's not drawing any reactive power from the grid and the grid, you can see the THD is three is, and the power factor is almost unity. And here's an island mode. There's no grid there. So the household demand has to be made by the electric vehicle. There it is, it's led by the electric vehicle. And since the current has to inject the current into the house, it's increased because earlier it was supplemented by the grid. It's another mode and the grid is giving uh, power to the household, there is no, uh, electric vehicle available, but the power interface is still there. You know, the low frequency power interface, which is acting now like a power quality one. So it will make sure that all the household harmonics on the nonlinear load is taken care of. By us. As a result, as you can see, and the load power is made by the grid, and whereas all the reactive power of the load is made by the power interface, not by the grid, and the grid power factor is still one, okay? Now here you can see the, the grid is giving charge in the electric vehicle and also supplying power to the house. Therefore, the grid current has increased. There you can 620 watts because 307 going to the uh, household, whereas 250 is charge going to charge in the battery. Again, the same thing, there you can see what actually happened, okay? The power factor is almost unity. So I have some more uh, results, but I uh, given my time, a limited time, so I wouldn't go into detail. Now you must be thinking, well, this is all really, really good, but is this going to be a reality? V2 existence is going to work. And when I was starting this work, as I explained, people laugh, okay? Just to put this in context now, 
place in the sun leave, leave to home, leave to home system there. And that can provide two days of household electricity. Of course, this can be grid connected. That means you cannot connect it to the grid. Why? There's no standard yet. It's going to be released soon. But you can power your house for two days. Okay, it's from Japan. Okay, it's called Chedemo. And now they're having a three-phase system. They're working on that. And the standards, it's been developed. It's called the IEC 63110. And it's been currently developed. And Chedemo, that's from Japan, is the only available system that complies with the standard. They have the vibrational uh, compatibility, energy flow, and globally accept charge. Chedemo is the most widely used charging systems, V2X chargers. And these are the V2G compatible or V2X compatible electric vehicles, the market. But we expect that what I heard is that uh, most of the electric vehicles is going to be compatible in future for bidirectional power flow. So V2X is already a reality. You can go to Chedema website and see and what is happening there. So you can see that the V2H and V2Load, V2L, and this is quite interesting and they um, predicting 2025 and V2G could provide additional revenues and cost saving of US 2 billion to global energy suppliers. And this hasn't been a new co concept and a lot of pilots projects and been uh, taking place since 2012. And not only that, you can go to the website and you can buy now things too. It's called the V2 X certified products on Chedema website. It's already available. Okay. And Honda, and they recently signed an agreement with White City, and the White City via Auckland University is working, and they want to develop vehicle to grid wireless grid energy management system. So we are actually Auckland University are working with them too. So as you know that, and um, none of the, this work may be possible without the help of other people. So I would like to thank all my students as well as my colleagues. Uh, here they are. So we have a very big group. And with that, I conclude my um, talk. I'm very happy to answer any questions if you have any. Okay, thank you. Over to you. Thank you very much, sir. It was a very informative and insightful presentation. I am pretty sure our audience learned a lot from that. And uh, we have a few questions already. In the chat sure. box. Uh, yeah. Yes, the you first question. Any questions? Is, mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I can see. Uh, that in too, wireless. Too. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Carry on. Shall I? Okay. In wireless EV charging, how do you prevent the electromagnetic field from causing electric interference? or even from impacting human health? Very good question. <laughs> yes, and that's a concern, but these are, as I think I, I touched that part, I mean, I talked about the challenges with the wireless charging in relation to magnetic pad design, the coil design. The coils are designed in such a manner that the, the radiation, the magnetic field and the electric field are within the standards there. So the leakage fail is minimum. There's no interference whatsoever. And even the inner, and nothing, even the medical, uh, you know, the implants. So they are not affected within. It is all confined to that space there. So they are very well within the standards there. And as I remember, it is about 15 microtesla, just within the one meter. And the electric field is, I can't remember, I think, oh, per meter. But they are within it's all uh, specified according to the, the, the standards there. So when we design these systems, they are within the guidelines there. So there's no danger. It's been tested. Did I answer the question? I hope so. Uh, so the next question is, uh, are you involved in power transmission over long distance using microwaves? If yes, can you educate us on how is it performed? No, because I think we, because the problem is the, the long distance that depends. So this is called the near field, okay? 
So the near field is the through magnetic coupling. Other one is the, the uh, is the far field, and the far field because it, it's normally the amount of power transfer, especially sometimes then uh, for consumer applications, I think it's about six point eight megahertz. Even there's a limitation of the amount of the power transfer because uh, obviously the safety reason there, and that's not my field of research, but the, it is not high power at all. For the consumer applications, even in a little bit far field, and that's about, uh, I think, 10 or uh, 50 watts, even I think less than 50 watts. And that is different, but other ones, long distance, and we do not, because how can you contain? And it's not good uh, at that frequency, um, very, very high frequency microwave, no. Uh, yes. Uh, what is the what reason is, to use? I, I can see, okay. Now the next question is, what is the reason to use AC to DC to DC to AC converting system? And the reason is that now the wireless power transfer takes place always at a higher frequency. And we can say, I mean, think about that, the Faraday's law, okay? And higher the frequency for the same amount of magnetic field, you get more volts, right? So exactly the same, but if there are some problems with you can't keep on increasing the frequency. Okay, why don't we go to gigahertz? You can't do that from there. And there are some issues there and the losses and a lot of things with the high power there. So nevertheless, but our electricity network is 50 Hertz or 60 Hertz. Now from 50 to 60 Hertz, we had to somehow or other convert into whatever the frequency at which the power transfer takes place for electric vehicles, it is 85 kilohertz. So how do we derive 85 kilohertz from 50 hertz? So the, the most or the common way of doing that is 50 hertz to DC and DC again to AC. That is why I have the AC to DC, DC to AC. Okay, so that is one question. And the other one is from Bharat. And is it possible to convert all vehicles to EV type like aero vehicles, plane or rockets? Uh, I am not quite sure what you meant by that is at the moment um, electric aircrafts and this is still taking place okay because the amount of power required and it's very very high so therefore it's in at megawatts levels there so for wireless power transfer um, systems being developed for megawatt level and that is for electric ferries and there is in no way, and that's about, I think, one megawatt, but that takes place at a low frequency. It's about, I think, low mid, relatively low, not 50 hertz. It's about, I think, one or two kilohertz, of due to obvious reason that you can't have you know, such level of power transfer at much higher frequency there, okay? So that the planes, they are working on that, and thing have the hybrid planes, electric planes, but not for, long range for short range, okay? And the next one, even with the presence of high-tech robotics, why can we align? Why can't can we align charging pairs perfectly? Yes, um, but the, the robots are different, right? Now you say that, yes, why can't we align? Yes, you can align to a certain distance, uh, to a certain extent but all to do with the manufacturers too. They won't have the minimum cost. More electronics, you know, the more control, they don't want to have it. So therefore, if you can do in a passive manner, okay, or an active manner, it doesn't matter, right? Whatever happens, the control techniques or the passive network, how the pads were just taking care of the changes in the coupling. And not only the coupling there, the system can be due to all the time and to changing the component values there. So system will take care of that. Okay. Any other questions? So I, think you, I think you missed one question. Is there any other hot topics through power electronics than EV? Uh, but this is electric vehicles. This is a, oh, heaps of things there. You know, this wireless power for is Either the big area, okay? In power electronics, it is the wireless power. It's a small area. So power electronics is a huge area. You can go to high power converters 
And then again, when you talk about the converters, they are a different application. The wind turbine, the solar panels there, the motor drives there, different, different application. This is just a small part of power electronics. We apply power electronics in the, the, the field of wireless power transfer. Then again, when you go to wireless power transfer, the dynamic wireless power transfer, they are here. Not only electric vehicles, what about the different applications, Con conver uh, converter? Uh, conveyor belts. There are heaps of applications in wireless power. It's already been licensed or even auto automation, factory automation, how to power. And that's been already done because still it's taking place. This is another application, electric vehicle. This is just the one application there. Okay. What else? Does AI contribute to wireless power transmission? No, AI doesn't have, because they see that this is a magnetic field, right? So the magnetic field, the mu naught, as you know, that the permeability is the free space. You know, it's like an AI coil. So we have actually AI, because we can't do anything because there should be a gap. So the air gap is unavoidable. And that's why our coupling is low, okay? So the, the nothing happens because, I mean, we ideally, we don't want to have air because when, you know, the reluctance is high. You know, it's like a resistance, right? Magnetic reluctance, when you have air without the magnetic structure, like a magnetic core, you know, for an example, for a transformer, that is why we use a magnetic core because the reluctance is low. So we can channel the magnetic flux very easily. But here, for this wireless, we want to transfer power wirelessly across a gap, so the air gap is unavoidable. So therefore the reluctance is high. And because the reluctance is high, that's why the leakage is high. Okay. There's another I question. Hmm? He's asking about artificial intelligence, AI. Yes. Does, uh, does AI, AI contribute to wireless power? Um, Maybe, I don't know, I haven't used it on AI, yes. It could be, there could be an AI, it could be the control philosophy or, and how to do it, I don't know. And we may be able to use AI to align and to control, yes. Maybe, I don't know, to be honest. Uh, and this, uh, in designing of transferring and receiving coils, what kind of things you should consider? Yes, consider is that minimum, I think I touched that one with the minimum material because all these coils, they contain ferrite. We had to use ferrite with a higher frequency, minimize the losses. Why do we use ferrite? That's the magnetic material to channel the magnetic flux or also to contain the magnetic flux. So we want to have for a given amount of MMF, MMF is like the voltage, right? For the analogy to an electric circuit. For the minimum MMF, you want to have maximum coupling, mutual inductance. Okay, so we want to minimize everything, minimize losses, minimize the, the size and the cost and the maximize the coupling. So those are the things that we had. And also we want to, we don't want to have, we want to have a well perfect or defined magnetic field. Because we don't want the magnetic field leaking out. So those are the issues we consider. Uh, do you have any questions? I hope your doubts were answered. My advice here to um, you is that always think outside. It's very good and I know this is not happening and I always encourage all my students and I, I really like to help um, our students. And uh, so what I tell them is that don't feel bad. Okay, if sometimes in the period you, you are so worried or people will laugh at me, right? And I don't know how to ask question. And uh, you never ever think about that. Let them think whatever they want. You ask what you want to ask. Okay, and that is how you can learn. Because always that is the, the peer pressure or peer, you know, how they think about me, who cares? If you want to learn, ask the question, whether it is a stupid question or it doesn't matter. Because sometimes even my, myself, sometimes I don't know. I ask sometimes, I don't know. I have to think about that. And my advice to you, other thing is always don't take anything literally as it is. Just question why it is so. 
just the book says that, don't believe it. You know, think about that and go by fundamentals. And if you go by fundamentals, because energy is energy, right? Nothing else there. And if you take a mortar, what do you have? <laughs> you have a coil. You know the active power, reactive power, and the reactive power is taken by, what is it? The inductor, nothing else there, the coil. And the active power, you transfer, you know, the power, actually the motor is like a wireless power because there's a gap there, right? Tiny gap there. So you convert the electrical energy into the mechanical energy across the air gap. That's what happens. And the power transfer takes place. And the active power, and you transfer some mechanical power convert other than the losses, resistances. So that's all. So if you think about that, where, the, where does, you know, what happens, where does my power go? That's how you should think about it. And, and also, we tend to take values, the computer generates, and they have no idea. Can I have a Miri Henry inductor? Can I have, I don't know, a 100 farad capacitor? Or let's think about that. If I work out, a, you know, uh, do a question, and I get trying to get an answer for that one, then, oh, I'm going to have one megawatt of power, you know? But given the conditions, is it possible? So if you think about, hey, I've got a 10 volts power supply, right? And think about that, can I get one megawatt? Well, what should it happen? You know, is it possible? So those are the things that you should always ponder and think about that the question, then you get a you know, better feeling of everything, the physical meaning of that, rather than just because the computer generates something, just because your calculator gives something, and don't take it, always think about it, okay? Two new messages, okay? Uh, what are the two ones? Oh, we use what software? We use finite element modeling, and that's for the magnetics and multiphysics, I think. We do that from Thea and SIS, I think, or JMAC call package. And for the simulator, we use a Plex and the MATLAB simulator, and that's for the electron circuits. And are there any limitations, fast charging in high cancer? Yes, very good questions. The question is, are there any limitations in fast charging? Yes. So just imagine that the battery, okay? The, the biggest problem with the battery is the heat generated because the losses in the... So all the battery charging systems and they have heaps of sensors to make sure that, you know, it won't, the charging process would not exceed the thermal limits. So that is a concern. I always ask this question too. People are moving into more and more high power, 500 kilowatts, putting it in a, within a very short period, of hundreds of amps going through to the battery to charge it. So to be honest, and it's a very good question, and it is something that I would like to do. I have encouraged some people to look into. I know that some companies so looking into that, this issue, and I can't actually tell you uh, what would happen because I actually don't know very much about the battery chemistry. It's a good question. I don't know. So, but to the certain um, the, the extent that can be done, and that depends on the, the battery. Yes, I hope all the questions were answered. And if you have any more questions, you can put it in the chat box. Uh, but since we have a time constraint also, uh, I think we can move on to the Kahoot session. Uh, Do I have to be here for that? Or no, I don't have to be, is it? Uh, So I believe I don't have to be there for that session. Okay, that's it. Yes, sir. We'll, uh, we'll continue with the Kahoot. So, uh, so uh, could you please uh, remain for, uh, to beat our thank you? Uh, are we giving the vote of thanks now? Yeah, yeah, let's uh, with the thanks and uh, after that, let's move to the Kahoot.
Okay, so uh, in order to deliver the vote of thanks, I would like to invite the Secretary of IEEE Power Electronic Society, Student Branch Chapter of University of Moratua, Kasuni Vani Nayak. Over to you. Thank you, Jarda. Uh, as the Secretary for this term of the Student Branch Chapter, uh, I would like to convey my heartiest gratitude to Professor Uday K. Madhavala for bringing us an informative session, which is much trending in the decade. And uh, thank you so much for that, sir. Uh, and then I would like to thank Professor Udanga Hemapala, Chapter Advice of IEEE Power Electronics Society, Srinivan Chapter of the University of Moratua. And then to all the participants of today's webinar for enrolling with us today, and really hope that you all have gathered valuable content through the session. Finally, I would like to extend my uh, heartfelt gratitude for everyone here today, and would love to make it a chance to appreciate the effort in joining this webinar, even under the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, to wrap up my thank you note, uh, I request from all of you to stay safe during the corona outbreak. And thank you once again for joining today. Over to Jada. Yes, thank you, Kasaniaki. And uh, I think, uh, so could you please remain for a moment to take the group photo? Uh, I'm, uh, I request our participants to turn on their cameras if possible so that we can take the group photo. What if they're all shy? <laughs> yes, guys, uh, let's give us a smile and let's take the photo. So all of you guys are final year? No. No, so yeah. Year one, year two, year three, year four, right? Yeah, and I believe we have participants from other universities as well. Okay, okay, okay. It's very good and well done and congratulations. And uh, it's very good. I mean, this, these are the things that you should uh, continue and being actively involved. If you need any help with it, uh, in relation to power electron society and I can, uh, since I'm on the committee as well, and then I can help you to get some support, especially for the countries like Sri Lanka. Okay, let me know. Okay, thank you very much. So I think uh, I'm good to go. Someone okay. in the OC uh, can. Right, okay then good luck for everyone with your exams and everything. Okay, take care. Bye bye. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, uh, audience, don't leave. We have a very exciting Kahoot session coming up. Um, now I want you all to either grab your phone or you can open up a new tab in your laptop uh, to go to the Kahoot quiz. Uh, so uh, the link is in the chat box. You can, as you can see, it's simple, kahoot.it. Uh, and also don't forget that the winner will get an amazing gift card. So uh, you can uh, log into Kahoot through your phone, just type in Kahoot in your uh, browser, uh, or you can go straight from your laptop. Uh, and also uh, only 50 can participate at a time. So this will be first come first serve basis. The first, only the first 50 will be able to participate. So hurry up and go to the um, website and we will tell you, we will give you the pain in a short while. Yes, as you can see in the screen, the pin is 4481269. The game pin is 4481269. Uh, type the pins as you can. We can only have 50 uh, players. So this will be very exciting. Uh, please, guys, uh, for your name, it's it would be better if you can uh, uh, type in the name you used for registration so that we can uh, recognize who you are. Yes, keep them coming. And 
it's better you can uh, type in the name you used for uh, registration so that we can find out who the winner is. Great, we have plenty of participants. I'll repeat the pin, double four eight one two six nine. It seems like that's all. Okay, uh, can someone of you see, tell me whether we should proceed? Okay, we have more people coming. Great. Okay, no one else can join. Now we can start the Kahoot session. I will be uh, telling the questions and you will have to answer as fast as you can. Doesn't matter whether your answer is correct, it matters, but you have to be fast. Okay, let's go. What does V2G stand for? Go fast, hurry up guys, you can. You know this, this is an easy one. Okay. Okay, we have Senora in the lead. Sorry, I guys. Did have I did have a connection issue there, but I can see that, I can see that people are playing well. Okay. The third question is: PHEV stand for plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. Is it true or false? Okay, time's up. Okay, Nipun on the lead. The fourth question, as mentioned in the webinar, what is the country with the largest EV sales in 2019? This is an easy one. Go for it, guys. China it is. Okay, Nipun is still on the lead. Can someone challenge him? Okay, the fifth question. An EV battery is charged and discharged using alternating current. Is it true or false? Okay. Okay, uh, we have LMNOP in the lead. Okay, he has the highest answer streak of five. Let's see. Sixth question. Vehicle to grid refers to bi-directional energy flow between an electric vehicle's battery and the char charging station. True or false? Okay, he's still on the lead. He answered six questions correctly in a row. That's great. The next question. 
As mentioned in the webinar, what technology wireless EV charging is mostly based on is it capacitive power transfer technology or inductive power transfer technology? Okay, we have eight people answering capacity, but the correct is inductive. Okay, it hasn't changed very much. Three players just hit answer straight three. Great, next question. Where is the IEEE headquarters located in? This you should know. Okay, New Jersey, USA is the correct answer. Okay, we have the same lead. Next question. The one before the last. Who is the PL, PLS president for year 2019 to 2020? Our professor mentioned this in the webinar, I believe. Yes. Okay, not much has changed. The final question. Is how many technical societies is in IEEE? How many guys? Okay, thirty nine is the correct answer. Okay, let's see who's on the podium. We have Sajipan in third place, Aswani in second place, and yes, LMNOP in the first place. We hope you tell us your real name so that we can give you the uh, Amazon gift card. Congratulations, whoever that might be. Congratulations, guys. That was a great Kahoot session. And our organizing committee will contact you soon to give you your prize. Yeah, uh, can we uh, figure out who is this LMNOP? So uh, I think uh, if we can get his or her real name, it would be really good. Yeah. Uh, uh, can this LMNOP reveal himself or herself? Uh, could you tell your real name in the chat? That would be great. Or else uh, you can... Uh, okay, I think it's Pulindu. It's Pulindu de Silva. You figure out the winner. So congratulations. Congratulations, Pulindu. And you will be getting an amazing gift card. Okay, uh, then we're, let's wind up the session. Okay, so, that was can you, uh, can you a great session. session. Thank, thank you for your enthusiasm, yes, guys. guys. Uh, thank, thank you very, very much for participating. participating and we had over 80, 80 participants, participants from the beginning. And I uh, hope you guys uh, learned a lot. And I hope this was a very fruitful session. Uh, so, uh, so, so I think, think uh, that, that we can wrap up, up the se session. Uh, I, think I think this was a valuable was opportunity for you to expand, to expand your horizons, your horizons on the subject of electric, electric vehicles. vehicles. And thank, and you, thank for you for being, being a great audience. audience. Stay safe. Have a nice day.